Hey guys, in today's video we're going to completely disassemble and rebuild a still MS660 chainsaw that's in serious need of some TLC. And as you can see, it's currently in bits, and I actually found it in bits, along with a bunch of other chainsaws, so I had to go through each and every single part to see which part fitted which chainsaw, and this is where we've ended up. And there are a number of important steps that you have to take into consideration when rebuilding an engine like this, like installing the crankshaft correctly to ensure there's no preload on the main bearings, ensuring you've installed the bearings correctly themselves so that you haven't damaged or wallowed out the pocket in which they rest against, installing the circlips for the gudgeon pin on the piston. If they're not installed correctly in the right orientation or you've even bent them just slightly, they can let go when the engine's running. And as you can imagine, it will lead to catastrophic failure. And by following the information that I'm sharing in today's video, you'll be able to use that knowledge gained and apply that to other two-stroke engines that you'll come across. And you'll find that there's only a small amount of variation between each one. This video should make for a fun, challenging and informative one for anyone that wants to learn to rebuild engines like this safely at home. The reason why they only gave up on this saw is actually a pretty serious failure. It's the main bearing which supports the crankshaft in the cases has actually let go. There's one either side in each case. The only one I can tell so far is the clutch side. I can physically wobble it up and down. The seal's also damaged this side, so it's going to require the cases to be split into two. We'll press the crankshaft out, we'll take the bearings out, and we really are going to have to do a nut and bolt rebuild on this machine to get it up and running as it should. So what we need to do is to separate the handle from the crank case. And to do that, we just need to pop out these little plastic keepers and there are torque screws in there. Let's transition to some power tools. Out it comes. And then we have this one and this one. These little parts trays are really handy, so if you haven't got one, just grab yourself one, they're only a few dollars. So now we're gonna remove these AV rubbers. It's uh, important to be really careful that you don't damage their pockets and you don't damage them. And in this case, I'm just using pliers because it makes my life a little bit easier, but you can use screwdrivers as well. Last but not least, we have this one up here, which we're gonna have to remove, and now this will fall apart. And there's actually no circlip holding this gudgeon pin in, so it should, there we go, just slide out. Bearing as well. So now to remove the cases, we need to take out the six bolts that are holding the two together. And then there are two pins that need to come out as well, they're alignment pins. There are two ways split cases on a chainsaw, or most two strokes with a crankcase like this. It's either a case splitter or a brass hammer. So if you've got the hammer, we literally just gently tap. Nearly there. You can see the damaged bearings. Oh, I <laughs> didn't expect that to happen. Anyway, you tap it out like that. We'll have to get a puller on that to get that off. That's fine, and then the other way, is the case splitting tool. You basically put it either side of the counterweights and then you just screw this in to the crankshaft and you'll see it will just push that right out nice and safe. This is actually a Husqvarna tool however still do make one but I actually think the Husqvarna tool is better. So that leaves us the crankshaft with the inner race. We have one crankcase with the full bearing another crankcase with the outer race of the bearing. So we need to get this inner race off the crankshaft and we're gonna do it with a bearing puller. If you don't have a bearing puller, you can just place this into the vise and gently tap on the crankshaft, but every time you hit the crankshaft, you run the chance of mushrooming it and it not then accepting things like the clutch, the flywheel, whatever attachment or piece that's gonna be put on top of it. Once the two half jaws are fitted, we place on the posts to each side. Crossbar goes on, washers and nuts go back on, lead screw goes in, and then from here we just gently pull out, like so. So just off camera, I've cleaned up the surfaces on the crankshaft, and they look really good. The next thing is to inspect the big end 
connecting rod bearing. You can just about see it in there. The first thing we do is a visual inspection of the bearings themselves, as well as the cage, make sure there's no cracking damage or deformation on it. That looks really good. The next thing we need to do is to test if there's any play. And the way we do that is you pull the connecting rod up and down and make sure there's no movement there. In this case, there's not. We want to test it in four positions. One, two, three, and then back around the other way, four. This one has passed and I'm really happy with it. The last thing to inspect is the connecting rod itself. Obviously, cracks and damage, it's not a good thing, but don't be surprised if the connecting rod is multicolored, blue, could be brown, could be red, could be straw colors. If that's the case, it could be one of two things. It could simply be the inductive heat treat process that happens at the factory, but it could also be that it's overheated as well. If you are unsure, double check the bearing, make sure that's not damaged, make sure that hasn't changed color. If their bearings feel good, look good, you're more than likely just looking at the inductive heat treat process that's occurred rather than overheating in the saw. So don't automatically assume that that needs to be replaced if it's a different color. The best way to get these bearings out is a little heat, a hammer and a socket. And what I'm gonna do is heat up the pocket for the bearing and then I'm gonna place two pieces of wood down. The cases go on top of that and we'll tap it through. And number two now. There we go. Everything's been cleaned up now. I've gone through both bearing pockets with some scotch bright to make sure there's no burrs or sharp edges. I've done the same with the seal pocket on the flywheel side. And now that just leaves us two bearings that we need to install back into the case halves. I'm going to show you two techniques today. We're going to go with the hot cold method and we're also going to go with a method that I learned from a chap called Matt Olson about using nuts, bolts and washers to actually pull them through. And I really like this method when you can't use the heat method because you get a lot of feedback. If you're to just tap it in with a hammer or you're to use a shop press, you don't tend to get that same response that you do with a nut and a bolt. If you look really closely, you can actually see the ball bearings are held with what's known as a plastic cage. Now, this is why it's good to know both methods. The hot cold method for this may work, but there is a chance that even if you slightly melt that cage that's holding those bearings, there is a chance that the bearing will fail again. So we're gonna use Matt Olson's method with the nut and bolt, and then we're gonna use the hot cold method for the uh, metal caged bearing. This model of chainsaw, we have to install the oil pump to set the right depth for pulling the bearing through. And that's another reason why it's a good idea not to use the hot cold method. There's O-rings in here, and as you heat the case up, the oil pump will get hot and you can damage those as well. Just applying a small amount of oil to the pocket, the outside of the bearing too. And in this case, we have to have the step of the bearing facing out because that's where the seal is gonna register against. And the bolt we're gonna use is this one. And I've got a few different ones. I've got all different sizes for all different eventualities. So just grab yourself a few different ones, different lengths, and you should be all set. I'm going to use a few old bearings as spacers, and then I'll place a couple of washers. My bearing. This will then go through the cases. On the other side, a couple more washers. And then the nut. And now what I'll do is put just a little bit of tension on that bearing and have a quick look to see how it's sitting. At the moment, it's slightly cantered back this way, at this angle. So with a gentle bit of tapping, just lightly, I'm gonna try and seat that a bit truer, like that. And I've already now introduced that slop because that bearing has now gone and run a bit straighter. So I'll re-tighten this up. I'll double check it again, give it a bit more of a tap. I've introduced the slot because the bearing's now seated, and now the bearing is nice and true, it's nice and square. So all I'm gonna do now is place one end of the bolt into a vise, that will hold that end captive, and the other end is going to be tightened up just with a breaker bar here. Nice and carefully, don't force it. And that is all the way home.
And now lastly, we're just going to check that that bearing is moving smoothly. What you can find is as you're pulling a bearing in like that, it can actually start to bind. Therefore, it would have to be removed and the process repeated. In this case, though, it's really nice and smooth. It's level across the face of the bearing, and we're all ready to work on the next one now. The other method is utilizing the expansion and contraction of the metals, and we freeze the bearing, and we heat the case. Now, it's really handy if you're going to do this to use an infrared thermometer. The temperature we're aiming for is 185 Celsius. At this point, it almost slips right in. It might just require a small tap to align the bearing. And I also like to use tin foil. Just roll it up into a small ball and place it in the seal pocket, and that just helps to retain the heat. In this case, we're gonna use a propane torch, and I just like it because it's quick, it's easy. The cases don't get so hot that you can't hold them. And although you can put them in the oven, I tend to find if powder coat gets heat soaked for more than about five minutes at around 200 Celsius, they tend to go yellow or slightly off color, a bit dull. It's just a preference thing. Both work just fine. And as mentioned, we're aiming for about 185 Celsius. You can go a little bit less, although you might find that you have to start tapping the bearing much harder. And if you go any more, it will just slip in a little bit easier. But with that said, 185 is where I really like to be. By the time the bearing's installed and I've started to use a little bit of compressed air, the temperature's dropped enough that it hasn't overheated the bearing and the cases are still cool enough to touch. As you can see, I did a great job aligning that bearing into the pocket, but it really doesn't matter. A few taps like this with the uh, brass hammer and it will go into its pocket just as it should. Notice how as soon as it's in its pocket, I use the bearing install tool to hold the inner race down and I get compressed air on it right away. This ensures that the bearing doesn't soak up the heat from the cases and get too hot. And then after just a few seconds of cooling those cases down, it's all you need to do. The bearing won't go over its critical temperature and you can pick those cases up and continue with your rebuild. The next stage is to install the crankshaft back into its main bearings that are in the cases. Now, the way we do this ideally is with a crankshaft puller. And there are a lot of different ones on the market. I've used this one, again by Matt Olson, extensively on probably 25 to 30 rebuilds, and they have been flawless. These tools are so useful for two reasons. One, they eliminate side loading of the bearings, which can cause damage and deformation of the little balls themselves. And secondly, it helps to reduce preload, which essentially is when the crank binds up and it can't spin. So the first step is to apply a small amount of oil to the inner race of this bearing. And this is just some two-stroke oil again, as well as the crankshaft too. And next we take the crankshaft and we start on the flywheel side and we place the crankshaft into the bearing. And then we take the threaded rod and we screw it onto the threads on the flywheel side of the crankshaft. We take the sleeve and that goes over the threaded rod and into, in this case, the seal pocket. And we just carefully align everything nicely. The washer goes on next. And then we have to have a quick look inside to find the threaded hole and install the long bolt. And now really carefully, I'm gonna gently pull that crankshaft in and making sure that the connecting rod is facing up and it's not binding on the case half. There should be minimal pressure here. If it binds, you stop. It's making a lot of noise, but look at how I'm literally just holding the wrench at the head. There's not a lot of force. You go until it stops. There it is. That is the crankshaft installed on the flywheel side. And because we've had this sleeve on the inner race of that bearing, there hasn't been any side load placed on the balls themselves. The next step is to tap these two alignment dowels into the cases themselves. And I only want them protruding a tiny amount, just enough that the gasket can hang on to them. And the reason why I want these to only protrude a small amount, they're gonna get tapped back the other way, is if they're sticking too far out, it just causes friction when you're trying to pull those cases together. I opted for a kit in this case with the seals and everything included. It actually works out cheaper. So this is the final opportunity before these cases come together to be able to inspect, check, make sure you haven't overlooked anything. And when you're happy, place the other case half on top and 
I'm going to put three bolts in which are going to hold the gasket in place. It's not to torque or to pull these cases together. And in fact, what a great opportunity to talk about that. Don't use the case bolts to pull these cases together. You're going to put side load on the bearings. You're going to preload those main bearings. It's just a really bad way of doing it. This time I'm going to use a wrench and all I'll do is just gently, just like last time, pull the cases together and it shouldn't be a lot of force. If it is, you've probably got a bind somewhere. Uh, now this is your very last chance before those cases are fully pulled together to make sure everything is good. So let's just gently rotate it round. Have a quick look. The gasket is aligned nicely. The connecting rod is in the position it should be and it's not bound either side. And I'll just have a quick look all the way around and on the underneath and it looks really good. I'm going to pull it until there's just light, light force that I need to apply. That's it. That's all you've got to do. Now notice here that when I rotate the crank, it moves freely. It's not binding and there's no preload. That's when the inner race and the outer race are forced in opposite directions and the bearings are getting bound. There's none of that happening here. And that's the beauty of using a tool like this. It's really controllable. There's no impact and there's no unnecessary force place through all the internals on the engine. But what happens if you accidentally introduce preload? Let's do it on purpose because I'm going to show you the most important thing that you must do before you complete the bottom end rebuild. So I'm going to put the tools back on. Let's introduce some preload. So even using the right tools, you can introduce preload. Now it's going to be impossible for me to really show. I mean, I can't even turn the crankshaft by rotate. Oh, there we go. I've got a little bit. I can't turn it. It's that bound. And what will happen is if you put that engine together like that, it's going to then seize up very, very quickly. You're basically forcing the bearings against the races and nothing's going to be turning smoothly. I've got some digital scales here and I've got the crankshaft at 90 degrees to vertical. And this will hopefully give you a representation as to how much force is required to rotate this crankshaft. That's half a kilo. That's a kilo. One just under 1.3 kilos of force to pull this crankshaft 90 degrees. Now let's remove that preload and we'll see the difference. So all it takes, and I'm not joking, is just a gentle tap each side on the crankshaft and that will shock the bearings and align everything nice and smoothly. One there, one there, and that's as smooth as butter. Let's go and get that luggage scale on it and we'll see just how smoothly it moves. In fact, even now I can spin it easily by hand. That's all it takes. Hopefully this is going to be in frame again. We'll hook that on. Crankshaft is at 90 degrees like it was last time. We'll turn it on and I'm going to gently just lift up and we'll see what reading we get. <laughs> it's up. 200 grams. That was literally it. That's probably just the weight of the connecting rod and the crankshaft itself. It's so free. It moves so smoothly. Now I'm just going to apply a few drops of Loctite to each bolt. The last stage is to install the oil seals. I actually have a dedicated video. It's only five minutes, but it covers all the pitfalls that you can run into and the problems caused if these aren't installed correctly. I don't want to repeat myself and this video is long enough as it is. So you can click on the image here and that's going to take you to that video. I hope you enjoy that one and I hope you've enjoyed today's video. This is five times longer than my normal content. So I think we'll leave it there. The bottom end rebuild is a great place to stop. Next video, we're going to work on the top end and then actually get this saw into some wood and just see how it cuts.